Hello, welcome to Mental Health Matters. My name is Barbara Myers and I'm the host of the program. Tonight's program will be focusing on schizophrenia. I'm very happy tonight to be uh, able to have two guests with me. The uh, first guest that I have invited here is Paul Clifford and he is um, a family member of someone who has schizophrenia and he'll be talking to us about that experience with his family. And secondly, we're very delighted to have as a guest um, Catherine Lum and Catherine has schizoaffective disorder which is very closely related to schizophrenia and she'll be talking about some of her experiences. So we welcome Catherine and Paul. Well, thank you, Barbara. Yes, thank you. Um, I thought I'd start out by just talking about what schizophrenia is and is not. Um, some people believe that schizophrenia means you have multiple personalities, and that simply isn't the case. Sometimes you even hear that on the TV, but that's not the, that's not what it really is. And also, sometimes you hear the word saying, I'm schizophrenic about something, or I, I can't decide whether to buy this blouse or that blouse, but also that is not what um, the meaning of schizophrenia is. So what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about uh, what it is, and then we'll have our guests talk about their experiences and their family's experience. Um, the way that schizophrenia is diagnosed is by psychiatrists is that there have been psychotic symptoms persistent for at least a month. And by psychotic, I mean loss of contact with reality or what most of us think of as reality. And they, I'll give you some examples of what some kinds of psychotic symptoms can be. Um, one example is a delusion. And delusion is something that is a false belief that a person believes all evidence to the contrary. Some examples of that are persecutory um, delusion, meaning that you believe you're being followed, harassed, cheated, poisoned, or drugged, and you in fact are not. Um, another example is what they call grandiose delusions, meaning you have a, a very largely exaggerated sense of your own self-importance. I and mean, you might even believe that you're a famous person like Jesus, Napoleon, or Lincoln. Another example is a delusion of being controlled, that somebody else, some other group of people or person, maybe the FBI, controls all your thoughts and your feelings and your impulses and your behavior. And another type of delusion example is jealousy, where you might believe that your spouse is having an affair when in fact they're not. So, and there's no, typically there's no way um, when someone has a delusion of convincing them that, that it's not true, that's something that's real to them. Um, another psychotic symptom that is very common with schizophrenia, schizophrenia is hallucinations. And that means that things that you hear or you see or you feel things that no one else does. And most commonly with schizophrenia, this is you hear voices. So you hear people talking to you, but um, in fact, there isn't anybody that's actually saying anything. Another type of, of um, psychotic symptom is something which is called disorganized speech or um, Sometimes they call it word salad, incoherent uh, thoughts and, and can't, you know, put ideas together. And a fourth, type, a fourth type of psychotic symptom is grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. That's somebody that's just simply frozen and cannot move, for example, would, would have um, catatonic behavior. So with all these various um, symptoms, people are unable to function socially or occupationally and, or be able to work. The prevalence of schizophrenia is about 1% of the population um, over the age of 18. 
which is a very low number of people if you think of how many people there are in the United States. Typically, the onset when it first starts is somewhere between the age of 18 and 25. When I introduced Catherine, I said she has schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is schizophrenia plus a mood disorder, and by mood disorder is either depression or bipolar disorder. Um, sometimes these symptoms can come from substance abuse or withdrawal from a uh, substance. Um, however, if they're persistent for um, at least a month, then that's when um, they start getting to talk about um, diagnoses. Now, I should mention that there are some anti-psychiatry groups that that maintain that schizophrenia isn't a legitimate illness, it's a problem of living. Um, and they certainly have their uh, point of view and, and some probably very good reasons for it. Um, however, I, it, it doesn't negate the fact that these symptoms that we've been talking about do occur in individuals and whatever you want to name it, um, they have to live with those problems about the causes. They're not completely understood. Um, at one time, it was thought that a cold, rejecting, hostile, and controlling mother was the cause, it used to call a schizophrenogenic mother, was the cause of schizophrenia. But that uh, view has been widely discredited. Um, it, it's believed that there's a combination of both genetic and neurobiological and environmental causes for it. Um, when the genetic factor comes from recent findings that show that members of a, in an immediate family, members are ten times more likely to have uh, developed schizophrenia if another member has schizophrenia. And identical twins, it's more like somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of uh, them will both develop schizophrenia. Um, some, some people get better from schizophrenia after the age of 50 but that doesn't happen in all people. So it's a very serious illness and affects the lives of people in a, in a very serious way and their families as well. So what I'd like now to do is to introduce Paul and have him tell a story of family member. Okay, well, thank you very much, Barbara. Yes. Um, I almost don't know where to begin because it's such a, it's such a long story and it's hard to summarize it in just a minute or two. Yeah. Um, Actually, two family members of mine have schizophrenia. Um, my sister Karen, my brother Thomas, um, and different kinds of schizophrenia. You know, it, it's hard to know if these, all, these different kinds all deserve the same name, even because they have very different sets of symptoms. So they were all very, they were both very seriously affected by it, and their, their lives were in many ways destroyed by it. Mm -hmm. My sister Karen, growing up, was just a, a normal, playful, charming girl. You know. mm -hmm. Uh, she and I were very close because we're actually fraternal twins, mm -hmm. uh, but we're all very close. We had six kids in the family, mm -hmm. sort of very closely spaced in age, <laughs> so uh, we were very tight growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, but something happened to her around college age, and she started changing. She started believing that um, she could talk with God. She became very religious, mm -hmm. and at first, you know, I just thought, well, you know, she's become involved with a Christian group on campus, and She's adopted a different way of speaking, mm -hmm. um, but gradually her behavior also became more and more bizarre, and eventually the Christian group sort of expelled her because they realized that she really was talking with God and hearing him respond mm -hmm. in ways that they weren't hearing. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly after that, uh, after another couple months of religious delusions, she just became overtly, totally psychotic, mm -hmm. unable to interact, unable to converse, uh, she became catatonic. Um, she, would, she would pose in, in different ways for hours on end. She became unable to eat. Uh, she lost in the course of a month or, or so maybe 30 to 40 pounds. Mm. Uh, her, her appearance was truly, really frightening. Um, it, it became very difficult for our entire family, mm -hmm. of course. And uh, there were several attempts to get medical help for her. But they failed, one after another after another. Um, eventually, she was admitted many times to uh, local hospitals or state mental hospitals. But it took probably six or seven years 
before she was medicated properly the first mm. time. Mm. So she would be admitted for maybe a week or two weeks, and then she would be expelled. They would have given her lots of antipsychotic medication, which, which would make a lot of the overt symptoms go away. But of course, she wouldn't take the medication as soon as she was out of the hospital because she didn't believe that there was really anything wrong with her, or the medication would would make it so she could no longer hear the voice of God mm. or us mm. because she could hear our own minds mm. <laughs> and different people she thought would be in her her own brain. She didn't really understand where her body began and ended and her, her own mental psyche began and ended mm. and another person picked up. Mm. So it was many years before she got uh, adequate treatment to be able to live for a few months at a time without needing to go back to the hospital again or without having to be picked up by the police or living on the streets or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it wasn't often throughout those years, through the first two decades, that she was stable. Mm -hmm. It was really only after at least 15 years, I guess, that she was stable enough and, and there was an opportunity for her to live in a supervised living facility where um, there was enough supervision to encourage her to continue on the medication that she could continue on it Mm -hmm. and then live a more normal life where she could have, you know, daily interaction with people and conversations with people. It was very, very hard on her, but particularly hard, I think, on my parents because uh, they went through this this mourning process with this this Mm -hmm. wonderful girl that they had mm-hmm. brought up yeah. right at the threshold of adulthood had sort of been taken from them yeah. and and became very, very ill for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, been a, it's been tough. Yeah. And it, it's been tough not just because of her illness, but because most of society doesn't understand mental illness. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. included most of the mental health professionals who dealt with her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's in part because it's very difficult to deal with someone who's actually floridly psychotic. Mm-hmm. Most people don't want to do it, not even most psychiatrists and nurses. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't have the legal means to deal with someone. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, mm-hmm. This all occurred in Maryland. Mm-hmm. And in Maryland, you couldn't compel treatment for someone unless they were a clear and present danger, unless they were threatening someone's life. Mm-hmm. And that meant that most of the time she was psychotic. Um, she was either living at home with my parents being in, in fear of what she would do because she was uh, so out of control physically mm-hmm. um, or living on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I guess the first time she got consistent mm-hmm. medical care was only after she had walked to Washington, D.C. to remove Ronald Reagan from the White House mm-hmm. and uh, the Secret Service became involved and, mm-hmm. and they said, you better put her in a hospital for a while. And so then she got consistent treatment in a hospital long enough to get her stabilized on medication. Mm -hmm. It's a shame that that kind of treatment wasn't available. It's also partly Ronald Reagan's fault because he destroyed (laughs) the mental hospital system uh, without funding any community health system in its place. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't treatment for her. And and how is she now? Well, now she's she's actually not in the mental health system, but she's living in a nursing home where um, medication is given to her sufficiently consistently Mm -hmm. for her to stay pretty stable but Mm -hmm. every couple months the medication is not given to her or the nurses forget or they just Mm -hmm. capriciously change one medication for another Mm -hmm. and then she becomes very psychotic and they can't Mm -hmm. deal with her and they take her to to an emergency room at a local hospital Mm -hmm. and then they try to Mm -hmm. restabilize her before returning her to the nursing home. That's the way it's been for two years now. Mm-hmm. My fear is that they'll just abandon her in a hospital. That's mm-hmm. how she ended up in the nursing home. She was actually living in a supervised living facility within the mental health system. Mm-hmm. But they, they took her to a hospital and abandoned her and pretended they didn't know her anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the hospital tried to find places for her, and we tried to find places for her. And it was a long time before we found a nursing home that would mm-hmm. agree to take her. Mm-hmm. So it's not an ideal situation. Yeah. Um, so it has ups and downs. It's a roller coaster, and it's been a roller coaster for 25, 28 years, something mm-hmm. like that, a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Now I'd like to hear from Catherine, who is um, living with it as a client, and talk about her experiences. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, I started having symptoms early in my life. Um, I guess um, for me, I remember feeling afraid of people and depressed too as a young child. Um, I remember in first grade I um, had this idea that came to me that if people really understood what it was like inside that they would hate me. And so the rest of my childhood was pretty much spent hiding inside, not letting people know what was inside me. So I, I never talked about myself or any in my feelings. Um, I had playmates, but um, they would tell me and share with me, and I, I wouldn't share back. And um, another thing that happened as a child was that um, I had some problems being teased in school and things, and I would stuff my anger instead of feeling, allowing myself to feel anger. I would stuff it inside me and tell me it was my fault that if I had been more like them, they wouldn't pick on me. And so it was really my fault for being different, for being somebody who was pickable. <laughs> so um, this went on throughout high school and into my um, first year of college. And I remember it, a time, a specific time, during I was out jogging with a friend, and it was over winter break from my freshman year. And um, it's like inside my mind, it switched, my mode of thinking switched from understanding people in the world and accepting them, accepting how they felt about me, and if it was good or bad or whatever. It was like something was coming up, my anger was coming back up, and I could no longer keep it down. I couldn't control it. I couldn't squelch it. And so what came out at that time in my mind, I think I crossed over from mental health to mental illness. And I didn't start to hear voices until a couple, maybe a month or two later. But inside my mind, it was like I figured, oh, now they're going to find out. Now they're going to hate me. Now they're going to find out what I'm really like inside, and they're going to hate me. Mm -hmm. And so um, shortly after that, I did begin to hear voices. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. Well, what were the voices like? What did they say? Um, for me, it was hate voices, um, and it has been, because the voices have continued on ever since then. But for me, um, my voices aren't from a disembodied source. I, I think I've heard a disembodied voice inside my head only once I remember in my life. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, my voices, they seem to come from other people in the environment. Somebody walking by, driving by, somebody I meet. Mostly strangers, mm -hmm. yeah. people, but for me it mimics reality. And at the same time, I know that I have schizoaffective disorder because there have been times when I know I've hallucinated something. Um, I used to hear my father say, I'm sick of it, I'm just sick of it. Mm -hmm. And I know that he didn't say that. Mm -hmm. And I heard my neighbor, a friend, say something to somebody about me and I know later on that she never said that, and I believed her. And so I realized, wait, I am hallucinating. Mm -hmm. But for the longest time, um, I, I thought it was real. I thought I deserved it. This is reality. This is what's coming back to me for what I'm like inside, and I deserve it. And that feeling of um, deserving it actually um, became, it was hard to diagnose. Because um, even though I was hearing all these voices and was floridly psychotic, and um, nobody really knew what was wrong with me. So my parents, like, they used to take me to a counselor, and the counselor would try to talk to me. And no matter how much they talked, they couldn't turn my self around. But finally, the, my counselor told my parents, well, she can't be helped. So they took me to a psychiatrist. And within five minutes, the psychiatrist says, you have schizophrenia, you have depression, you need the medication, I'm going to give you this. This is an illness. You can get over it. Mm -hmm. It's not something you're doomed to feel the rest of your life. And the idea that it was an illness, right. that was new to me. Mm -hmm. Very, very, and, and to my family, to know that there was a name called schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. 
that explained what I was going through. So um, once I was on medication I'm, and medication was strong enough, I also noticed a very profound change in my thoughts. It's like before, my thoughts had been like a whirlpool, just obsessing, thinking, 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 thinking. How can I get out of this? How can I change myself so people won't hate me? What can I do to deal with all this hatred? It was like a whirlpool. And I remember for the first time lying in bed and feeling like I had just been thrown up on on the shore. I had been shipwrecked in the sea and the waves had been crashing over me and I have been struggling to keep afloat and then then I found myself on the beach and resting and feeling peace peace just for the first time that I ever remembered and then I remember the first day I said you know this was a good day I hadn't had a good day for the anything I can remember and I think part of having this all my life having part of this actually made it easier for me to deal with when it was when it was at its worst because I didn't know what happiness was back then mm-hmm. I didn't know what it was to have peace of mind and happiness mm-hmm. and so I figured this is the way life is life is hard but well now that I know what happiness and peace of mind is I think it would be very hard for me to go back to have to experience that level mm-hmm. of yeah so that's basically where I'm at okay um, I'm going to ask this to both of you. Some people who have schizophrenia have trouble staying on their medications, and you obviously have found medications that work for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was wondering, um, well, this, this particular issue about people staying on their medications is a contentious one, but usually between patients' families and uh, consumer groups or pe- people consumer groups um, and I wanted to know if why it is why you think it is that people have a hard time staying on their medication well I actually had a hard time at first at it, first you did yeah okay. I had a hard time taking it because I know that I felt happier when I took it uh-huh. but at the same time it reduced the intensity of my feelings and my life and my experience and life became much more Mm -hmm. normal but I missed that intensity and I I know that that sometimes the side effect of it this is a side effect of the medication that it it does tend to dampen your emotions but what happened was that my psychiatrist asked me are you taking it Mm -hmm. and I said sometimes (laughs) <laughs> and she she gave me the scare treatment. She told me, if you don't take your medication regularly, you might never get better. Mm-hmm. And that idea scared me so much that ever ever since then, and I still to now, I I will take my medication religiously. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. Now, I, when I talk with people, um, many times they don't take it because of side effects that they experience, or and some of them, and each person is different and has a different level and different numbers of medications that work but but usually what I try to do is tell them to try to work with their doctors instead of um, and, and talk to them about side effects and so mm-hmm. forth so that they'll um, you know be able to find a combination that, that works for them and not just be either you know completely out of control or completely drugged you know which is mm-hmm. some people go between those situations um, um, it's hard for me to know what m- my sister's perception of the medication was. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, for, for decades she has not wanted to take medication. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, in your case, Kathy, you have all this insight into a, mm-hmm. an illness. You say, okay, well, I have a particular illness, my brain doesn't work quite in this way, the medication helps it work better, so I take medication. Mm-hmm. But my sister has never had any kind of insight like that. Mm-hmm. You know, all her hallucinations all the voices she hears are still real they're just continuously real and so she doesn't mm. think the medication will help uh, and then there, mm-hmm. there are side effects and I think the side effects are worse for people who don't have insight because they can't work with their doctors yeah. and they can't you know, have rational discussions with their doctors and talk about the side effects yeah. as easily yeah. and so they tend not to get much medical attention 
and, and so they aren't as closely monitored. And the long-term effects of a lot of the, the heavy-duty antipsychotic drugs are really tough. Yeah, the side effects are terrible, and they yeah. cause, you know, lip smacking or tongue would roll in your mouth all the time, and all the muscles get really tight. Yeah. So it'd be hard to, to move and to even control your emotions, and legs and arms would sway all the time, okay. or she'd gain a lot of weight, all kinds of things. Yeah, we could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> That's a very interesting subject. What I want to do is leave the audience with a challenge. In the next week or two, I want you to listen for whenever you hear the word schizophrenia and reflect about whether it's being used correctly. And if you feel you can and you feel it needs to be done, challenge it. Challenge harmful uses of it and suggest helpful things instead, like writing a letter to the editor of the newspaper, speaking to a teacher, addressing an elected official, that kind of thing. So that's your challenge for the next couple of weeks or so. Um, I want to leave you with some resources for schizophrenia that are, are helpful to many people. The organization that's, that's sort of the premier organization that's advocate for mental illness is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. NAMI, N-A-M-I. They have a wonderful program called the Family to Family Program that helps teach families about schizophrenia. Uh, There's an organization called Schizophrenia Information. Web address is on your screen that gives lots of good information. There are resources like a Wellness Recovery Action Program, W-R-A-P, that helps people to make plans for themselves. For those of you who need it, the suicide hotline is 1-800-SUICIDE. Thank you for joining us, and I want to end by saying, take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. I want to thank Paul and Catherine for being with us.